Hello everyone, I'm Pedro, I'm a software engineer from Meta, and I'm here to talk about Velox, which is our effort on creating a new open source unified execution engine. I'm just first going to go over the motivation on why we developed, why we decided to develop Velox in the first place, and give an overview about what the library and what the Velox program is, talk about some of the integrations and the use cases we have internally and, and, and externally. And, and then move to a deep dive and talk a little bit, a little bit more about the details and some of the algorithms leveraged by the library. By the library. So we're coming from a place where we have a large variety of user workloads. So we have a workload from analytics to real time to graph, monitoring, transactional, and to more recently a set of different machine learning workloads that are quickly becoming the larger, largest consumer of data systems and making us rethink how we develop those systems. And user workloads are likely to evolve in the future. So the traditional way to, um, to address this problem is by engine specialization, which means that we develop a new engine, uh, or customize and focus on every, uh, every different type of workload. And then we get to this place where we have many different engines. And well, of course, this is just a subset of some of the engines available and some of the engines used inside Meta, just to illustrate, but there are many, many more. Even though there's some similarity between those engines, the reusability is still very limited. It duplicates efforts and forces engineers to reinvent the wheel. It's also hard to maintain and to enhance. It's hard to choose which engines do you add new features and which engines do you optimize. Also, in the end of the day, it exposes some of the inconsistencies between those engines to end users. And just thinking that users usually need to interact with many different engines to achieve a particular task. And also, ultimately, it hurts your capacity to move fast and to innovate. The good news is that, if you, is that if you look closely to those engines, they're usually composed of the same set of layers. So all those engines have some sort of language front-end, which in some cases a, a takes a SQL string or provides a data frame API or provides some sort of DSL that generates some sort of logical plan or an IR that goes through an optimizer and generates another IR or, or a physical plan that gets passed to some sort of execution runtime that uses an execution engine to actually execute those operations. Particularly if you look at the execution engines, they're all very similar. So Velox is an effort at trying to unify those, uh, those, all those different code bases into a single library that can be reused and, uh, and kind of optimized and um, leveraged by all those different engines. So Velox's mission is to converge, accelerate, and unify execution engine across Meta and beyond. And we're doing that by developing a new shared library, the Velox library, by defining data processing APIs, which are common between those different engines, and then actually integrating this library inside the, the code base of these engines. As a quick overview, Velox is a C++ database acceleration library. So we provide generic APIs that can be reused for, for different use cases from batch to interactive, to stream processing, to graph uh, analytics, to transactional systems, and even to AI and machine learning workloads. And the key concepts there are modularity and extensibility. The old library is implemented in C++ and a native code for maximum efficiency. All the algorithms implemented are vectorized to fully leverage data and instruction level parallelism. And we like to think that the library is state of art. So we actually look at all the different execution engines uh, in, different, in different systems, and we kind of consolidate all those optimizations and we implement them in a single library. So in a way, we're kind of democratizing some of those optimizations which are available today in some uh, ad hoc engines. Um, and making them available uh, to all the engines leveraging Velux. The library is also open source and has been developed in partnership uh, or in collaboration with partners from both academia and industry. So we say that Velux is a database acceleration library that's very different from being a full-fledged uh, database management system. So Velux takes a fully uh, optimized physical plan as input. So Velux doesn't provide any uh, language layer front end. We don't provide a full optimizer. So we don't have a SQL parser or a data frame layer. So even though we don't have a full optimizer, Velux there implements a lot of adaptivity. And you can think, adaptive, you can think of adaptivity as being uh, the sort of runtime decisions you can make when you start executing uh, your query plan and based on some statistics like reorganizing and making the execution more efficient. But we don't, we don't provide a full-fledged um, optimizer. Another way to think about Velux is that it sits on the data path. So everything that runs on a single host on a computation, on a compute engine uh, can be 
uh, it will be provided by Bellux, and everything else related to control plane or the orchestration or how this data or, or how, how those um, the work is distributed between different nodes, uh, all of those are outside of the scope of the library and should be should be implemented or there are the responsibility of the engine integrating with Bellux. So Velux values prop value proposition is threefold. First of all is efficiency and latency. So by implementing uh, all, all those optimizations and consolidating in a single library implemented in C++, like we're seeing really good efficiency and latency wins. The second benefit, benefit is co a consistency and consolidation. So it, based on the fact that we're integrating Velux in different engines, um, so using the same library, providing the same set of functions, the same set of corner cases and mode behavior and different exceptions, it, it helps provide users with a more consistent user experience. And third, reusability. Uh, so you don't need to optimize, you don't need to fix bugs uh, in all the different engines. You can do that in a single place. Also in the future, in the future as user needs evolve, uh, when you develop new engines, you don't need to develop the execution engine from scratch. You can just leverage uh, the library, which is already built. So just quickly going over some of the Velox use cases. Uh, we're integrating Velox in a large um, number of different systems from analytics. Uh, so we're integrating Velox inside Presto in the Prestissimo project, which was uh, open, open source recently. Velox is also being integrated in Spark. So we have two Velox to Spark integrations, one internal uh, in matter called Spruce, and one developed by Intel, which was recently open source called Gluten. We're also integrating Velox in the real-time infrastructure and stream processing systems and data warehouse and database ingestion systems and even on the log messaging, uh, log messaging pipe itself. So we, we have transactional engines starting to uh, be being developed using Velox and we're also integrating Velox in many different systems uh, on the machine learning ecosystem. Like I mentioned before, Velox is open source. Uh, so we have a fast-growing open source community. At this point, we have more than 100 developers uh, from Meta and from other companies developing uh, Velox. So, and Velox was open source uh, about uh, six to seven months ago. So here there's a link to the GitHub repo. We also recently published a, a paper on VLDB 2022, which will be available um, in early September. So just getting to some more some more of the details of what Velox looks like internally. So Velox provides many different components. So it provides a type system that allows users to represent scalar and nested data types, including structs, maps, arrays, tensors, and more. We have a vector uh, component which allows users to represent columnar data sets. We have an exp expression evaluation model that lets users evaluate expressions represented using vectors. There's also a component that allows users to express custom functions uh, and implement both scalar and aggregate functions. We have a set of uh, operators that follow the SQL uh, semantic and implement things like order buys, group buys, hash joins, and etc. We also have uh, primitives that help engines to implement I.O. operations. So we have pluggable file format, storage adapter, like a connectors, uh, connector APIs and network serializers. We also have many primitives around resource management that help engines to implement memory pools, arenas, spilling. We also support SSS, SSD and memory caching. So for this presentation, for uh, due to time restrictions, I'm going to focus only on vectors, expression, evaluation, and functions. Just talking a little bit about vectors. So vectors is very similar to, to Arrow. So the memory layout we implement in, Be in Velox follows the Arrow format but has three main differences or extensions. So the first one is that we provide more encodings. So in Velox, in addition to everything that Arrow provides, we also provide um, constant encoding, which are vectors that only provide a single value, and run length encoding. Second difference is that our string representation is slightly different. And the third one that we provide support for out of order writes, and that's mostly to speed up the execution of conditionals. Uh, and that means that we need to have a different uh, representation for complex types like uh, arrays, uh, maps, and structs. And I'm going to describe them a little more in, in details. We like to think this in a little bit of an ambitious way that uh, Velox Vectors is a, kind of an extension of Arrow. Uh, we also provide an Arrow CABI interoperability layer. So if your engine either produces or consumes Arrow, you can still uh, use them with Velox. And recently, we had a discussion with Voltron Data and with help from Wes McKinney. We, we um, 
we, we try to upstream some of those optimizations to the to the val to the arrow community. So there's a discussion uh, with the community on this link. So for describing what does memory layout look like? So for flat vectors or for, for flat arrays, there is no difference here. You have one vector containing or you have one buffer containing the values, one buffer for nullability, the size of the values depending on the depends on the size of the elements you're trying to represent. You have vectors, vectors can be represented by uh, vectors usually contain contain different buffers, and buffers can own main memory or can be uh, can be views on top of other buffers, and those buffers can be shared and reused safely. So the first difference is how, on how we represent strings. So this is based on the work by the TU Munich uh, on Umbra. So basically the string representation is composed by, a six, by 16 bytes per string, where for those 16 bytes, the first four bytes represents the string size, the, the next four bytes uh, contains a string prefix, and then the, the last eight bytes has a pointer to an external buffer. And this representation has a few properties. Uh, the, the first interesting property is that uh, we basically transform a variable size vector into a fixed size, uh, fixed width uh, vector, and that means that the strings can now be uh, can be written out of order. Also, short strings, which are up to uh, 12 bytes, can be inlined, and don't, don't, they don't need to reference data on an external buffer. And that also means that if you're doing things like comparisons, you can short circuit things. Like if you're comparing two strings, and if you you can only look at the prefixes, and the prefixes are already different, you don't need to actually follow the pointer uh, and look at one external buffer. It also gives you a lot more flexibility to implement uh, string functions like trim and substring, uh, where you don't actually need to copy and to reshuffle the entire vector. You can just play with the, the pointers. So it lets you implement some of those functions with uh, zero copy. And this is just a quickly quick example of how the actual C++ uh, structure, uh, structure looks like. There's also a small difference on how we represent arrays and maps. So wh where the main difference is that instead of just having one vector with the elements and one vector with offsets, we have a, a vector with the elements, offsets, and sizes. And that the use case there is mostly to help speed up the execution of conditionals. So here we have a case where um, you, uh, you're trying to write elements from one vector to the even positions on one output vector, and then another element to the, um, to the odd positions of that vector. So in that case, you can first evaluate the, the condition, generate a bit mask, and then on a vectorized way, you can, uh, you can evaluate the then clause and then the, the else clause, and then write those elements uh, out of order. And again, you can only uh, write those elements out of order you, on arrays and maps if you if you if you have both offsets and and, um, and size values. So so you can play with the pointers. It also helps us implement or like play the interesting tricks on some of the functions that that actually act um, over some of those uh, those data types. We also make heavy use of dictionary vectors. Uh, here there's no difference, like the representation is very similar to what, what Arrow provides. Um, and in, Vel in Velox, we use them for two um, main different reasons. One of the reasons is kind of the traditional um, usage of representing, uh, having a more compact representation for vectors that, have, um, that don't have a, a lot of distinct values. But we also uh, extensively use dictionary vector for um, cardinality reducing and cardinality increasing operations. So things like if you have a vector and you want to apply a filter, you don't need to actually write those elements to a new filter. You can just wrap that into, into a dictionary vector that only contains the elements that pass the filter. And then in a similar way for cardinality increasing operations like uh, implementing joins and nest. And then the assumption there is that you're not executing those operations over scalar numbers, which are fast and, and easy to copy, or you're, you're executing those, those operations over complex types that might be ex a lot more expensive to copy. Also, lately, um, we also have uh, I.O. readers uh, for Parquet, ORC, and other file formats. And, and in those cases, if the, the data is actually represented on desk as dictionary, when you read them, they are already represented in memory as dictionaries as well. We also provide this concept of lazy vectors, which are, late, which are vectors that only get populated upon first use. And this is also very interesting for cardinality reducing operations. For instance, if you're reading a few columns and you're pushing down filters to the table scan, um, the columns that are not needed for filtering, they are actually represented as lazy vectors. And in, depending on the selectivity of those filters, we might avoid materialization whatsoever. Moving to expression evaluation. 
Um, so expression evaluation is a, is a component that lets you execute expressions over data represented using, uh, using vectors. It takes an expression tree as the input that represents the user expression. And it's used in a few different use cases, like inside the filter project operator. Uh, it's also used for table scan when predicates are, are being pushed down. And it can also be used as standalone for engines that only need uh, expression evaluation um, functionality. Expression evaluation is executed in two main steps. The first step is uh, compilation. And here we implement some of the traditional uh, optimizations like constant folding, uh, but we also do conjunct flattening where you have, if you have nested conjuncts, we flatten them into a single, um, in, into a single con uh, conjunct uh, operation. And this helps uh, to implement things like adapt conjunct, conjunct reordering where dynamically while you execute those operations, you can keep track of which conjuncts are dropping more results faster and then execute them first. We also implement common sub-expression sub elimination, and here we have an example. So you have a large expression that have common sub-trees. We actually identify those three at compilation time, and we only execute them once. So during the execution, the, the execution is done by a recursive descent of the expression tree, and we, we pass down a, a bit mask that represents the active rows. So here we have a quick example where you're executing to um, like one, uh, one expression, uh, A greater than five, um, followed by B less or equal than three. So this is executed by first evaluating the, the left side of the, the conjunct um, and specifying the active rows. So in this case, you're, you're still evaluating all the rows. And after you execute A, you update the active rows with the, the element that actually passed the first conjunct. And then when you execute the, the right side of the conjunct, you execute that over a smaller subset of rows. And on each evaluation step, uh, you only, the expression only get evaluate, evaluated if the current node is a common expression. So if in that case, um, if you detect that this com the current node is a common expression and that has already been evaluated, we can completely avoid the, uh, the evaluation. And, and, and if any of the inputs are nulls and uh, the current node uh, propagates nulls, in that case, we can also uh, avoid the expression evaluation. We also have some other interesting optimizations like peeling uh, in cases where you're executing expression over data dictionary encoded. So in that case, we can actually peel and removing the, wrap, the wrappings and only execute the expression over the distinct values. And we also use this for memoization, uh, which are in, in cases where you have multiple um, kind of sub subsequent buffers that use the same uh, dictionary wrappings. So you can actually execute that just once and then use the same uh, results to, to generate multiple result sets for, for the, 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 the different batches that are represented using the same dictionaries. Just quickly talking about the functions. So VLUX also provide APIs that allow users to provide custom functions. So for scalar functions, we have two APIs. One that we call simple function API that lets you represent your logic on a row by row basis. And this is all template based and all inline and auto vectorized. And we have an API that lets users specify the, the function logic in a vectorized way on a batch by batch basis. So our main focus is developer productivity. And for users, the row by row API is a lot more intuitive. Uh, so we do, we do a lot of work to, tr to try to make the simple function API uh, efficient and very simple to use so that users only need to use the vectorized API if they actually have a vectorized logic in cases like is no cardinality, map keys, and map values where the logic can actually be implemented over one entire batch on a zero copy basis. We also provide uh, function implementations that are compatible uh, with Presto SQL and Spark SQL in two different function packages that come with the library. This is just a quick example of what a simple function looks like. So you need to provide a, a small class that implements this call method. Um, and then when you register that, the templates are, are instantiated. So simple functions also provide proxy objects to access uh, complex types. Uh, and, and the idea there is that we don't want to copy that into uh, the array data into any kind of intermediary data structures. You actually want the simple function to reference the underlying vectors directly. We provide uh, fast paths for buffers that are null free and flat buffers. We also have uh, ways for users to specify the determinism and null behavior of functions. And we have advanced string processing 
uh, features like ask fast path. So when you define one um, when a string function, you can specify one generic path and one one path that assumes that there is no that there are only uh, ASCII characters. Functions can also control the ASCII behavior. For instance, uh, if you have a function that every time you get ASCII uh, ASCII inputs, you only provide ASCII outputs, uh, and that um, allows Velox to skip the, the ASCII evaluation, uh, the ASCII detection code. Users implementing um, functions over strings can also specify buffer we use. So for things like um, we mentioned before, if you're implementing substring and, and trim, you can, you can also implement that without actually copying the, the contents of the strings by just playing with the, the pointers. Velox also provide APIs where users can specify aggregates, and you can specify the accumulators, and you can specify partial, final, single, and intermediate aggregations, which are things that can be reused and mixed and matched by the engines depending on the data processing needs. Here, I'm kind of quickly just showing you one quick experiment with uh, Presto Prestissimo. So Prestissimo is the, the project where we're integrating Velox inside Presto. So for this specific use case, we looked at one of the internal workloads we have inside Meta. And we shadow uh, the same workload on a, a traditional Presto DB using the Java execution engine, and compare that with results on this new Presto, uh, this new Prestissimo cluster that uses the Velox uh, expression evaluation. So this pro this shows a histogram of how many times the C++ execution was faster in terms of CPU time. So you can see that the middle bar is how many queries were six times or six to seven times more efficient, and a lot of the queries are actually 10x or more uh, efficient than than, uh, than the, the old Java code base. We also have some more results on on the Spark integration and some of the machine learning, um, some of the new machine learning integrations we have. There are some more results in the paper uh, if you're interested. This is a few closing thoughts. So Velox is a strategic investment for Meta, and we really uh, try to increase the adoption in the industry. So we do, we do believe that there are lots of synergy and collaboration opportunities with both industry and academia. So if you're interested, please don't hesitate on reaching out. Uh, send us a message or just uh, reach out to the, our GitHub repository.